panel, which we will discuss different parts of the world and different industries for the transformation. So let's start with our introduction. My name is Louis. I grew up in Hong Kong. I work mostly in the mobile. So look forward to everyone's sharing. Oki? Okay. okay. Hi. Uh, I'm Oki Matsumoto. Uh, I'm a CEO, founder and CEO of Manex Group, uh, which does online brokerage business in Japan, in the States, in Hong Kong, in Australia, as well as uh, through joint venture in mainland China. And also uh, we have asset management business, and also we have a large crypto exchange business in Japan uh, called CoinCheck. So we do kind of globally the uh, online financial service provider business. Okay. So, uh, uh, Aura? Um, yeah, uh, greetings everyone, um, distinguished guests, my fellow panelists, Dr. Frank Jürgen Richter and the wonderful audience from around the world. My name is Ira Keener, co-founder and CEO of DLogical Corp. Based in the Philippines, DLogical is a physical commodities digital marketplace that has reinvented and reimagined smart procurement and a smart supply chain using automation and soon artificial intelligence, machine learning, and blockchain, which I will be speaking on idiosyncratically with respect to the Philippines. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, ladies from... Um, battery hardware company and we are also doing um, smart batteries basically to power um, all kinds of different applications. My background, I also have a background in the legal industry um, so I'll be sharing more from different perspectives ranging from how the legal industry is very slow to digital transformation um, all the way to the other extreme which is entrepreneurship and how uh, we adapt um, digital transformation to for survival purposes, basically. Great to meet okay. everyone. Wonderful. So nonetheless, uh, Joe? Great, thanks, Lewis. Uh, my name is Joe Landon. And I'm the Vice President of Advanced Programs Development for Commercial Civil Space at Lockheed Martin here in the US. I'm responsible for Lockheed Martin's space exploration strategy, and I lead strategy, business development, and R&D. Uh, for our human and robotic exploration, uh, weather, climate science, earth science, commercial com and commercial communications market. Hmm? Whoops. <laughs> okay. Have you finished your introduction, Joe? Okay. So, can we go back to Oki to share about the uh, industrial changes for digital transformation and also what happened to the Olympics? Okay, thank you, Luis. Uh, so, the uh, as the same as anywhere in the world, the COVID situation really, uh, you know, changed the uh, entire kind of landscape. Uh, so. Um, in Japan, the same, you know, the many people now working from home. And, uh, you know, interestingly, that really uh, accelerates the uh, digital transformation. I mean, even the very old fashioned Japanese companies, now they are kind of forced not to have uh, uh, you know, employees or executives in the office. So they had to do a lot of uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, digital transformation um, for them. A recent data actually shows the uh, for the entire listed companies in Japan, you know, it's about 4,000 uh, companies, entire listed companies in Japan for the calendar year 2020, uh, their uh, cost declined by uh, their, 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 their cost, their, their profitability increased by 10 to 15 percent only because of their you know cutting cost meaning that uh, you know they're now you know doing uh, less 
you know, business trips and, uh, you know, lots of things happening uh, from home. Uh, they can reduce the uh, real estate cost and such and such. So uh, they're talking about the, the, for the entire the corporate Japan, the, uh, the profitability increased by, uh, roughly speaking, 15%, which is very, very large. So that kind of thing uh, is happening uh, right now in Japan. The Olympics is uh, Olympics are coming, uh, I hope, uh, in July, and nobody still uh, knows uh, what is going to be really the exact case. And uh, but uh, we are doing a lot of. Uh, I mean, thing is, you know, we can't really do many things, many preparation uh, very in explicit way because knowing that it may happen, it may not happen. So there are lots of a kind of uh, hesitancy uh, to do a, a, a lots of a digital transformation type of uh, investment uh, into a metropolitan Tokyo city uh, right now. Having said that, because of the COVID, of course, you know, uh, people uh, do not want to touch cash, paper cash or whatever cash. And, uh, and Japan uh, tend to be, uh, from the beginning, a very digital savvy. Uh, so uh, there are lots of uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the transformation for the, uh, for the uh, transportation system and everything happening in Tokyo right now. But as I said, unfortunately, uh, it's not as vivid as it should be because of the, uh, this uh, COVID uh, situation. The, um, you may know that, uh, you know, the Beijing uh, you, is working on that, uh, creating a CBDC, you know, a central bank digital currency, uh, e yuan. And I hearing, I'm hearing that uh, uh, the e yuan is already being tested in uh, Wang Huqing or those places in Beijing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Bank of Japan is also... Uh, uh, doing, uh, I believe uh, they just started uh, a POC of the uh, EJPY right now. Uh, we are hearing that uh, China probably introduced uh, e yuan to the Beijing Olympics, which is happening in a year, um, and whereby the, the people from the world come to Beijing and use uh, e yuan CBDC. So Japan is uh, trying to match uh, that as well. So uh, very uh, quickly uh, developing the uh, Japanese version of uh, CBDC uh, right now. Once the CBDC, uh, EJPY, or whatever it may be called, uh, once it is introduced, uh, it will increase the uh, interoperability uh, dramatically among you know, the uh, crypto assets as well. as There are so many, how do you say, uh, payment methods uh, in Japan. If you come to Tokyo and then uh, ride on a taxi, uh, in each taxi, there is a kind of, uh, you know, And all those uh, 40 different payment services are not really interconnected. So that is uh, a huge, I think that's a huge, big problem. But with the, uh, uh, the CBDC, hopefully, uh, EJPY uh, will be introduced. The interoperability among those all payment systems will become uh, much better. And it might actually converge into the uh, just the one uh, CBDC, EJPY. But anyway, that, that is happening uh, in Japan uh, right now. So uh, things are moving, uh, but as I said, because of COVID, uh, many things are moving kind of, how you say, somehow behind the scene. And you are not kind of experiencing many of those things right now uh, on the surface. Uh, because because of the COVID-19 strain. But Japan as well, you know, vaccine is now getting uh, being uh, shot. Uh, so things will dramatically change. Sometime within a few months, 
so that uh, we can have Olympics and uh, and we have some fun, but uh, uh, it's not uh, very clear right now. So uh, I think one other thing I might add, uh, actually uh, the, the most common payment way right now is scanning the QR code in China, but it's invented by Japan like 15 years ago, right? You guys put in the poster for QR code for clicking to the website promotion. Yeah. I, yeah, I do think that like, Japan has a very advanced payment method, uh, but I don't really uh, respectfully agree for having many, many payments is a disaster. But right now, China only have two payment methods, like Alibaba one, the Alipay and the WeChat, mm -hmm. which makes us more like mon monopoly or oligarchy. So I think it might be a good idea, not 14 payment system, but like, at least six oh, or seven. Oh, oh. Right. Not, not, not 40, I'm sorry, 40, 40. Oh, oh my God, 40 is too much. Yes. Too many, too many. Okay. Many. But, yeah, but I, many. I hear you, but I hear you. Yeah, so right now, I mean, in China, most of the people didn't bring cash anymore. E even the, 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 the street, the, the little, like, uh, like whatever, so they all do. All, even the, the, the street performer, they don't take coins there already. They just put a piece of paper of QR code and then you can just pay them digitally. So, I mean, yeah. So right now payment is the major transformation. I mean, without the condo rival, I think Norway, they said they would cancel the legal tendon, like the cash by this year, but I think they delayed it. So they, 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 they are very ambitious because they have a little uh, population. So, I mean, yeah, so for Olympic, I think it will happen, as your prime minister said. Good luck. <laughs> I mean, I hope I can come. I mean, I canceled twice for my ticket. You know, I buy the ticket to Tokyo. I buy a book the hotel. But, yeah, I might need to get a vaccine before I go to Japan. Yeah. Well, you know, that is, I'm a trader. You know, uh, I, used to be, I used to be a trader at Goldman Sachs. I was a partner in charge of trading and risk taking, blah, blah, blah. But that particular thing, if Tokyo Olympics is happening or not, is the last bet I want to take. <laughs> because nobody really knows. Nobody yeah. really knows. Yeah. Uh, how, about, how about the airline? I will bring, because we have a space uh, like uh, industry, I really want to ask about how, what happened to the airline and also other more advanced industry. Did they affect it? Because airline in Europe, I think they're in a bad shape because they had a lot of loan and debt and the capital from government for injection to save them. Even in Hong Kong, Cafe Pacific, we have a special SPV just to inject more capital for them to survive one more year. So what is the, how is the situation for airline in, in Japan? Are they, they, they're dead. You know, the really, you know, revenue went down by like a 90, 95% or something like that. Thing is, interestingly, many of those airline employees are now working temporarily at the different uh, companies. Uh -huh. Because they are kind of, uh, you know, well-trained people. And uh, so some other, you know, companies, like if it's, uh, if it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, if it's like a department store or if it's uh, whatever the industry may be, there are lots of demand for people because Japan is suffering uh, with the, the declining population, declining work for, workforce, so that other companies are utilizing those, uh, you know, airline companies, employees temporarily, temporarily. Mm. So it's kind of a good, uh, how do you say, harmonic kind of, uh, you know, the co-working. Uh, in, in the community right now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, look at if even your citizen of Japan or was still hesitating to come, go to the Olympic. I think right now, uh, uh, good luck. I, I have nothing to say, but good luck. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, Oki. Okay. So, may, may I we move on to uh, uh, Philippines a little bit, like uh, what happened to FinTech? And I'm mean, very happy that uh, Ira prepare a slide, but I hopefully like you don't over overrun the time because you have el uh, like 11 slides. It only take 10 minutes for you to share. I promise so to be very fast. Okay. 
Okay, so allow me to share my screen. Okay, for some reason it's not allowing me to share my screen because there's a poll that's being... Oh, let me edit. Okay. okay. Okay, great. Let's try that again. Okay, so um, I'm going to be discussing the current tech and trends as well as uh, how to digitally transform a corporate um, from the point of view of, uh, I guess, the Philippines. So having said that, can you see my screen? Yeah, we do Great. now. Okay, so um, let's go over some of the fintech first. So I'll give an overview of blockchain in the Philippines. So uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission released new trading rules and regulations for cryptocurrencies in 2018, opening further potential for the widespread use of currency in the country. An article by Fintech Singapore outlines no less than 41 crypto businesses currently licensed in the Philippines in April of 2019, and that number is sure to grow in the future. The Philippine Daily Inquirer reported that 2018 brought, up, brought two major conventions on the blockchain to the Philippines with the Global Blockchain Summit and the inaugural Blockchain Achievement Exhibition, both taking place in June. The second iteration of Blockchain and Bitcoin Conference Philippines was also held in October of the same year, showing the slow but steady growth of interest in cryptocurrencies in the country. Finance, the Banco Central in Filipinas has begun exploring the possibilities of blockchain, stating that it could be used to smooth out some issues with correspondent banking. The BSV has shown positive reception to moving more and more tra transactions to the di digital format, and blockchain is one of many ways it can increase security and efficiency. In addition, the Banco Central in Filipinas has also approved the project centering around a real-time remittance corridor without a central operator, a process that can be further aided by blockchain technology. In terms of private banking, Union Bank has led the way for cryptocurrency and blockchain use by private institutions in the country. Since 2018, they've launched several interna international blockchain, sorry, internal blockchain applications and plan to release several more to reduce costs. Union Bank has also launched a blockchain system that will aid in connecting rural banks. Business, blockchain can be especially useful on, for entrepreneurs and in a country where the majority of licensed businesses tend to be small to medium sized enterprises. That's a huge deal. Competitions for the best startup concepts that make use of the blockchain as well as hackathons have been increasing in popularity in recent months. Real estate. The realm of business and finance isn't the only area where blockchain technology seems to shine. In 2018, Business World reported the launch of a blockchain-powered real estate platform called Acquire, which seeks to link together real estate properties and transactions in Asia using the technology. This is one way for Philippine real estate agents to broker and sell to foreign buyers without the need for expensive trips and fees using smart contract technology for for cross-border transactions. In politics, this piece in the da Philippine Daily Inquirer explores the possibilities of using blockchain to verify and confirm electoral results, eliminating the chances of fraud and cheating. Smartmatic Philippines in particular has been eyeing the use of the tech to enable clean, fast, and safe elections that allow voters to send in their ballots for the safety of their own homes. While that future may be a little ways off for now, the possibilities are definitely exciting and it remains a topic to keep an eye on in the succeeding years. Services. The recent spate of water and electricity interruptions in the recent months have prompted questions about the ways that social services and systems are constructed and provided in the, in the country. Electricity distribution giant Meralco has been eyeing ways in which to use the blockchain technology and artificial intelligence can be used to increase the efficiency of its services. Meralco has been working to digitize its services and transactions since 2016, and the use of the blockchain may be the first in many steps to complete this process. So now I'll go over the uh, uh, smart procurement and uh, the supply chain in the Philippines and how we've um, reimagined it. So basically, um, the pain points are that you know we've we have a very manual process, lack of transparency, limited access to financial tools, bank, bank clearing cutoffs, and limited access to logistics providers. The solution, NRD D logical. So D logical is a truly competitive selection process. Um, for procurement that will generate the best price in the market. It introduces a custom payment solution for liquidity and um, allows um, uh, access to multiple logistics providers. It also connects businesses to the nearest storage facilities for cross-border trade. So while um, the all-pervasive nature of the, uh, of the commodity business, um, uh, these are just some of the industries and sectors that where we already have traction. So construction companies, hospitals, white gas stations, shipping lines, aviation, commodity trading firms. And um, this is the interface. Um, it just gives you an easy order placement, need-driven timeline, competitive selection process, automated documents, custom payment solution, order tracking, and uh, some testimonials from some of our clients. They love us. 
or at least we'd love to, like to think they, they, they do. Um, and so going forward, um, the logical plans to adapt a fully decentralized platform using blockchain and introducing peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, as well as trade finance um, also using the blockchain and tokenizing commodities. Uh, um, so basically having asset-backed asset -backed, uh, tokens or sorry, commodity-backed tokens along with uh, developing private equity, uh, private e tokenizing private equity to promote more liquidity for private companies and for fundraising. So this is us, um, that's me on the right uh, and my co-founders and our advisors on the, although, I mean, sorry, that's me on the left, my co-founders and the advisors on the right. And at the logical, we like to end by basically saying we can create a world where we can, where demand can meet supply cheaper, faster and better. Thank you. Okay, so this is the quickest introduction I have been heard. So thank you, uh, Iara. But I, well, you still got a little bit time, but we want to understand yeah. how how was the travel business, like travel company, doing the digital transformation during the coronavirus? Did they do virtual sightseeing or whatever? Because I understand part of the Philippines was highly reliant on the travel leisure like industry, right? Yes, uh, the the travel and tourism industry here in the Philippines has been absolutely obliterated by the uh, pandemic. And so with all the travel restrictions in place, although there are already uh, protocols and defense mechanisms that are, you know, that, that have been established, uh, such as vaccines, contact tracing, and of course, you know, um, taking people's temperatures at the airport, um, all of these proactive measures still aren't enough to make one want to travel uh, with, with all the travel restrictions in place, you know, the, the quarantines. Uh, so th there's a huge impact um, on the Philippine tourism and aviation industries. Okay. So, so I, I, did you guys issue any travel bubble arrangement with other country already? Uh, as of this time, um, no. So it's basically there's no uh, most favored nation, uh, uh, no, no most favored nation status for any of our uh, for any of the other countries. So our borders are still pretty much um, uh, still pretty much very controlled. Okay, cool. I think uh, Taiwan already have a first travel bubble with the island of Palau, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I, I have a, more politically. <laughs> yeah, Palau, like they only have twenty thousand people on the island, and I think yeah. they are very uh, touchy about the coronavirus. They even brought all the American because you know they are highly rely on American aid on the financial support, but they still, yeah, don't come. So right now, I mean, they just issued yesterday. So now they have a charter flight four times a week. Yeah. So yeah, you guys finally can travel. Yeah, to one country. <laughs> okay, all right. Cool. So, yeah, so the four stores, uh, Catherine, so uh, please share what happened to Singapore and Taiwan. Are you based in Singapore, Taiwan right now? I'm currently in Singapore. So, I actually flew um, last year yeah. July from Taiwan to Singapore. And um, to be honest, Taiwan wasn't that badly hit by coronavirus at all. I mean, uh, we pretty much operated as, as normal. And I think there was a there, there wasn't a lockdown. Uh, we were all wearing masks. Uh, we have the same mentality um, as uh, Japanese as well. We wear masks uh, even when we fall sick. So it's not much of a, it's that it's not that much of a change for us to be honest. And so everything was as per normal, and I was just shocked because we still have to meet our customers um, face to face. So there wasn't that much of digital adoption, if, if you could call it that way. Uh, within the country itself. Um, cross borders, obviously, we had to do um, a lot of uh, video calls, etc. But um, I think I think the topic of digital transformation is interesting because it actually happened before COVID. And it's yes. just been a situation by COVID and basically forced by COVID, if you could put it that way. So not a lot of companies has has thought about how do you adopt a solutions to or strategies for digital transformation. I'll just give you an example here. Um, I was... I was uh, a lot they, they, the lawyers bill they will charge to the customers 
So there's no incentive for them to adopt any solution or software that actually accelerates their process because that's, that's reducing their time cost. Um, so that is an industry that, that you can see that it, that is slow to change, not because it, 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 it not because of the management, et cetera, because there's no incentive to do so. But then we look at the other spectrum where I go into entrepreneurship and we are forced to adapt solutions um, to accelerate a sales process, to digitize the sales process, to um, basically keep trackers um, on how our marketing emails are being responded to, to have all these uh, um, basically metrics that we can measure. And these are very important for us. So we have to use software like, like HubSpot, like Salesforce, um, and even, you know, um, other other type of email e email software is for uh, basically just tracking what is the open rate for each of these emails, what is the reading rate for each of these emails, who has clicked on what kind of call to action buttons, etc. So I think digital transformation um, needs to come from some sort of strategy, and it's, it's it's basically affected by two things. One is the industry that it's in, and second is the management. How what is their view on on digital transformation? I think as mentioned by um, Oki earlier, some of the companies are actually doing uh, digital transformation in um, Japan, you know, just to, to for cost cutting purposes. And that that I think is a strategy. And some of the con companies uh, would actually adopt digital transformation to speed up their sales engagement process. And that is to generate more, potentially generate more revenue in the future. So I think for each of the different industries and each of the different companies, it is vital or crucial to actually um, determine, okay, we are not just using digital transformation to, because we are forced by COVID. We need to think about why are we doing this? Uh, and I think the points made by ERA makes a lot of sense as well. You know, uh, using uh, cryptocurrencies, um, how do you accelerate the process? How do you make the process more efficient? Uh, using um, um, Bitcoin, using blockchain, how do you make the whole supply chain, for example, more, more efficient? Um, and one of the things we face as a hardware company um, during this whole process is uh, one of the most important things, definitely because of supply chain, uh, the breakdown of supply chain back in um, early 2020s, that has caused an impact to us as well. And also just the whole tracking of um, where where are my goods, you know, where where are my where's my stuff, and all that all that kind of thing. It could be really helpful if there was some sort of um, um, ways and mechanisms for for that information to be shared to us. And uh, one of the things that we couldn't we couldn't bridge, or we couldn't use it just the transformation to bridge, um, was maintenance issues when we had to maintain our customers' goods cross borders. How do we do that? It's software we have smart technologies for 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 our batteries for our products, but it's not. It, it's not extremely helpful, and not all of the problems are attributable to to software issues. So we still need hardware, we still need maintenance. How do we make sure we can build a network um, to to basically allow all our digital, uh, you know, to to put digital transformation in between our midst to make sure our operations are efficient? I think that's something that um, I would love to hear the thoughts on this as well. Yeah. So I, I totally agree. Uh, the, the, the coronavirus ex, uh, accelerated the, the, the digital transformation process because last time when China had the first Alibaba and also the e-commerce, no one, no one wants to use it. But the SaaS, I think the SaaS actually helped uh, uh, doing a big favor for Alibaba and, and Taobao. So now we have a coronavirus, I think, uh, uh, just like the platform we are using around the world, it started right before the coronavirus. The, they were... Uh, discouraged by the IPO of Zoom because they take the first buy, but around the world, the founder told us last last panel was with uh, around the world uh, founder. They said actually they have more marketing uh, capacity, so they allow more players in the in the area of video conferencing. So yeah, I think I think it, it, Taiwan do a really good good job. Uh, I, I have friend come from part. part uh, uh, coming back from Palau, which is the Taiwanese, the biggest uh, Chinese family in, in Palau, uh, the the tracking is more human, uh, not that, I mean, China is doing a great job, but it's very, not inhuman, but very robotic. It's like a lot of tracking devices, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But in Taiwan, it's like you just feel like you are just grounded. You just get grounded by a parent. That's it. And then uh, the food is nicer. I mean, I can guarantee this. So, I mean, 
Yeah, I mean Taiwan and Taiwan is doing a good job because they can self-sustain. Singapore, Hong Kong was also doing a better job compared to Europe, but we are a hub. I, we don't, we can't self-sustain. So that's why we can, we need to open the border no matter what to import, export people, uh, goods and food as well. Yeah, I think um, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore has have met a, a lot of uh, significant uh, example and a leading role model. I mean, we are missing Korea. I mean, Korea doing good job as well. Uh, not for the coronavirus prevention, but digital transformation. So, yeah, I mean, we already covered the Asia part. Then we are, we are looking to the another continent and also another area scenario uh, in other arena, which is space, which is we, I'm not sure we need to sign any NDA. Please <laughs> don't share any confidential information or I'll get that list by the FBI. So the floor is yours, Joe. Sure. Yeah. So I think just picking up on uh, some of what Catherine said, you know, Lockheed Martin had to make some fairly drastic changes uh, when coronavirus happened. Uh, so we had uh, talked about, you know, early last year in January of 2020, we had talking about, oh, let's run some pilot programs where we, you know, have some two or three or five percent of our employees work remotely. And then just a few months later, you know, we were the majority of our 110,000 employees were working remotely. I mean, the safety and uh of our folks at at the office was really important. And because we're a manufacturing company, some folks had just had to be there. So we basically made room for the folks who had to be there by anyone who didn't have to be at the office was home permanently, almost overnight. Uh, so there was a big uh, transformation process there that required changes in how we work you know, and how we uh, how we recruit also was had to be completely changed. We had to find new ways to keep our, our uh, program staffed and how to uh, bring folks into the company. Uh, without them ever coming into an office. Um, we also, you know, we had to continue to deliver uh, for our, our program. So we support, uh, as you know, you know, national security and critical infrastructure for the U.S. and, and other countries, including some, some of your folks' countries, be able to continue to, to deliver. Um, picking up on uh, some of the supply chain comments, I think that was a really interesting uh, challenge for us, too, where we had to make uh, uh, just, just trying to figure out who would, Making sure that we're receiving information and and products from the suppliers uh, was really really critical. So those were those are some of the challenges. So also, uh, can I just rephrase it because uh, also because the condo virus, you guys they speed up the the practice for working from home entirely, except the necess necessary personnel. Right. How can you? So when I a little bit more in depth, how can you guys secure the communication and uh, the the flow of the information while you are you're not using a, a intranet or a control environment? So maybe you just use a laptop. Like, what was the security issue or precaution? Yeah, so we actually you know are required by some of our customers to use. Uh, U.S.-based servers. So when we use Zoom, we use a, a version of Zoom that uses U.S.-based servers, and 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 uh, you know where we can understand and control the path of the flow of information. So that's one thing uh, that we've had to do. And the other, there's certain information that we just do need to be on site for in a secure uh, facility that we can have physical control over. So those uh, that type of work just still needs to be done at a at a facility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, to my understanding, this most secure job, not, I mean, not, not the, the sensitive material security, but it's more secure because you guys are not technically very competitive. You don't have too much competitors. And then during the coronavirus, it's not easier to look for other com a company or jobs. I think you guys, in, in, in general, it doesn't hit that much, right? Except the, the there's no conferencing, no expo, no air show, right? So it, well, it, I, don't know, I think, um, yeah, Boeing and Northrop Grumman might disagree, you know, that there's no competition. But I think it is a different uh, type of competition than, than what uh, other commercial companies face. Um, but, you know, not being able to go and interact with the customers uh, in person was was a change just like any other industry uh, there's still a lot of relationship sales and uh, you know our sales and our, our business development work takes a long time you know it takes years to get a, a new mm, 
Okay. So, yeah, I mean, uh, can you add up a little bit more? Like, I'm, I, I only read from all the outside sources being very focusing, the media would be very focusing on what happened in SpaceX. But actually, mm -hmm. I think that the founder of Amazon have another company which also catching up, right? So, the, 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 the right. Bezos. Yeah, yeah, so, Jeff, Jeff can you Bezos. Bit, yeah, a little sure, bit more yeah. about this Katu company, like what happened to them right now and who is leading? Sure, there's you know literally thousands and thousands of space companies and hundreds of new space companies every year and uh, lots of money being invested by private investors into new space companies. Um, mm -hmm. So there's it's a really robust industry. A lot of the attention is on SpaceX, uh, but there's so many other folks that are are uh, participating in this industry as well. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, is one. His company is called Blue Origin. Uh, and they're mm -hmm. based in Seattle, Washington, and we're partnered with Blue Origin. So Lockheed Martin is part of Blue Origin's team on the NASA Human Lunar Lander uh, mm -hmm. program. So we're working together to build a uh, lunar lander that will go and take people from uh, lunar orbit down onto the surface of the moon uh, as one example. But Blue Origin also is building a new rocket called the uh, New Shepard, which is another heavy lift um, rocket that would compete you know, with, with SpaceX. They're uh, a couple years behind uh, where mm -hmm. SpaceX is. Uh, but they are in that market, and, and you know, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, bet against Bezos, you know, being successful there. Oh, you you would bet on, or you wouldn't bet on? I wouldn't bet against Bezos. So. Ah, so would you not. you pay along? You mean they will right. be there? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I mean, uh, we still have some time. I mean, like uh, it's quite challenging to to give an overview of all the transformation happen. And uh, I, I really like to share more, but I want to ask the audience if anyone wants to ask a question, you can press the button in your in your in your control panel that I can allow you to speak like to the speakers or else you can type in your question on the comment section, the conversation boxes. Uh, that will be great. Or between the speaker, you can ask any question with your fellow panelists as well. Anyone? Okay, then then it's mine. Okay, uh, I I maybe I can share a little bit. I just still got five minutes. Uh, maybe I can uh uh share a little bit what happened for China, like giant company for digital transformation. I mean, uh, for con video conferencing, remote working. The software, the, the Chinese version of Ding Ting, uh, uh, not a Slack in China is that called Ding Ding, like a Ding Ding Ding. The working WeChat actually is the same thing with, with a different interface. The very delightful uh, part function is they can interconnect it. So uh, if you don't like a person, you only work with them, you can put them in the working WeChat account, which is the same number, same cell phone number you're using. And then they cannot see your your, your tweets or, or moment and pictures. So before, if you were at your a coworker, you need to block them and then you need to uh, differentiate different groups Right now, you can all put all the working people in the working WeChat, and also the the the, the all the salesperson from other content. Uh, but for most digitalization right now happening in the so, uh, state-owned enterprise, you know, so state-owned enterprise right now, the the new um, policy that issued by the uh, the latest uh, People Congress, they have very specific target and goal that they need to do transformation within this SOE. You know, most of the government, like state-owned uh, enterprise government, they have closed circle in intranet. Some of them, they're still using burning a DVD to carry their, their information without throwing internet or USB. So right now, they, they are paying a lot of money and, and also the, the infrastructure to upgrade it. And very interestingly, last year of October, you know, all the big four, the MBB consultancy company, they have all of digital surfacing, right? But they only belong to one of their surface line, what which is not an entirely new branding or company. So Deloitte, one of the big four accounting 
consultation servicing for firm and start a new company entirely last October. So uh, it, it might not be coined Deloitte anymore, it might be that Deloitte something, but the Chinese name already com comes out. Uh, this is a, a sign is very dedicated to 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 help the giant company in China to do uh, digital transformation, not only within by using upgrade or infrastructure, by ac acquiring new company. So this is very important because the gene geno the gene in SOE cannot be easily transformed with a short time. And then the market actually didn't allow you to have spend too much time. So they will buy or inject capital to another startups and then that let, let them to put up all the surfacing offering to help them to transform. So, uh, other than using IPO, uh, MA for other competitors, Another exits for investor for startup company in China right now. You need, you can share, you can sell your share or equity or entirely to stay on enterprise right now. So this is very funny. Just like, uh, maybe Sony or, uh, uh, or Toyota buy in an, uh, in, in, in tiny new startup company, not only invest, but buy. Okay. They merge them and then from them, the bottom up to, 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 to transform their own company. So this is a, a trend that I see right now because I do digital transformation advisory, uh, back in the day in Anxing Yang. So yeah, we started this like three years ago, telling the, the listed company to buy digital company. But I think the private sector already know this idea, but you know, SOE is very big in China. So they take three years to understand that kind of concept right now. Uh, people are trying to, to, to put up a, a list of company they can buy yeah, to help them, which is nice because all the company, all the innovation initiatives start by SOE fail. They can't do it. Simply, they can't do it. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thank you for everyone. I won't stop you from going to other, like the closing panel or other panel. And I, I look forward to, to connect with all of you or maybe also the audience. I will leave my email address as well. So, um, everyone, uh, travel safe, uh, stay healthy. And I look forward to see you in Horizons Asia and China meeting. Okay. Great. Um, Thanks. Sayonara. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks.